Good evening. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Bradford Cornell. He is an esteemed faculty member and renowned expert on finance theory in both the public and private sector. After receiving his bachelor's, master's, and doctorate from Stanford University, he has gone on to establish himself as an internationally recognized consultant and economist. Dr. Cornell has held positions at both Caltech and UCLA and has published around 100 academic papers. Additionally, he was hired by AT&T to advise on its entry into the nationwide local telephone business and continues to work with Fortune 100 companies and US government agencies as an expert witness. Currently, Dr. Cornell is focused on keeping a foot in two worlds, academic research and teaching, and practical investment management through his advisory position at Cornell Capital Group. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Bradford Cornell. Thank you, Josh. Uh, usually when you hear talks about investing, people are telling you how to invest or attempting to get you to give them their money to invest, give you your money to invest. I'm not going to be doing that tonight. I'm going to be talking about three of the great fundamental concepts that underlie the, the theory of investing, as developed by a, a number of people, virtually all of whom won Nobel Prizes for their work. So let's get underway. The three things I'm going to be talking about are the efficient market hypothesis, the Grossman-Stiglitz critique, and the sharp arithmetic. Now, I recognize that some of you are finance students, and these may be well known to you, but I think even in that case, you might learn some things tonight. And I also recognize that some of you probably don't know much about finance at all, so I'll try to explain some of the concepts as, as uh, practically as I can. So let's get started. This is Gene Fama. That's Gene Fama at the bottom when he won his Nobel Prize in 2013. That's Gene Fama at the top when he first put forward the idea of the efficient market hypothesis. Gene was actually a Division III football running back, something he was always very proud of. And what Professor Fama said back in 1970 is that a market in which prices fully reflect available information is called efficient. And if you were at the panel this afternoon, you heard this word efficient thrown around uh, all the time. And <clears throat> the basic idea behind this efficiency is that rational profit-seeking profit investors with access to detailed information compete to find misvalued stocks. I'll talk mostly about stocks tonight, but everything I say applies to other things as well. You could say compete to find misvalued investments. Because of this comp competition, the resulting stock price reflects the available information or takes it into account. Now, this theory has one really nice property that Lucy Van Pelt recognized, which is, I've come up with a perfect theory. It's my theory that Beethoven would have written better music if he'd been married. And Schroeder says, what's so perfect about that theory? And Lucy says, it can't be proved one way or the other. This is also true of the efficient market hypothesis. It says the market price reflects all available information. Well, first of all, we don't even know what all available information is. Second, we don't know what it means to reflect. So this is a theory that sounds wonderful and has almost no practical content. And Professor Fama was well aware of this and in his Nobel acceptance speech tried again and again to explain what the theory really meant. And the first thing he said is all tests of the efficient market hypothesis are joint tests. And I'll tell you what that means in a second. So first, you have to agree on an asset pricing model. And what Professor Fama meant by this is that you have to have some type of model that tells you how the market trades off risk and return. And if you don't have that, you're out of the game at square one. But let's assume we have an asset pricing model. Then second, the asset pricing model can be used to compute the risk-adjusted return on competing investments. It tells you how much more return you should get for risk, and it tells you how to measure risk. And then with those tools, the efficient market hypothesis says 
that all assets earn the same risk-adjusted return. In other words, there are no free lunches. There are no undervalued investments. No matter what you invest in, you're going to get the same risk-adjusted return using this asset pricing model. And that's a really important implication that we'll draw out uh, a little later, but it has all sorts of implications for managing your own personal money. <clears throat> so, why is the efficient market hypothesis so hard to test? And we're going to talk about three things. Noise, non-stationarity, and I'll explain what these are, and data mining, that you only get to see the history of the world once. So let's start with noise. Now here are two investments. If in 1926 you invested one dollar in short-term U.S. Treasury bills, which are generally considered the, the least risky security available, by the end of 2017, that one dollar would have grown to twenty dollars and fourteen cents. If you took that same dollar and invested it in the overall U.S. stock market in 1926, that dollar would have grown to $5,553.82. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd prefer $5,553.82 to $20.14. And this seems to say, well, it's obvious that the stocks offered a higher return than the Treasury bills. Well, not so fast. Here's the question. If we were doing an actual statistical test, we wanted to say, did the stocks do better than Treasury bills? How many years of data would we need to reliably conclude at a scientific level that the stock market actually outperformed the Treasury bills? And this is very relevant because people may tell you, oh, this investment did very well last year or last two years. Well, here you've got two things where there's this massive difference in how many years of data do you need to reliably say that one was better than the other. And you have five choices, three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, and 40 years. So think for a second, which one do you pick? The answer is you need 40 years. And we're making one of the most stark comparisons. So if, if you're presented with information showing that one investment did better than another over something of even five or 10 years, that's far too short to conclude it was not just due to random noise. <clears throat> now, you can get a better appreciation for the role of noise when you plot the, the, the data in a different way. That first plot was, I was just accumulating the returns year after year. This shows the actual annual returns. The blue are the returns on the U.S. stock market, the red are the returns on Treasury bills, and here is the zero line. So you can see the, the Treasury bills are basically risk-free. They never have a negative year. But the market is all over the place. It's that all over the place is why you need the 40 years of data. That is what in statistics is referred to as noise, and it makes it very hard to compare competing investments. <clears throat> so the answer is, if you want to know what, whether one investment is better than another, you just need a long time period. Now, unfortunately, 40 years is pretty long, and for some, you may even need 50 or more. But if you had enough data, you'd be able to draw meaningful conclusions, right? Well. Not so fast. There's another problem. You have to worry about what's called non-stationarity. And I realize I'm delving into a little statistics here, so let me explain how it works with an example. So here I have a jug. It has four red balls and six blue balls. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a ball out of the jug, write down whether it's red or blue, put it back in, shake it up, repeat the experiment, and just continue in this fashion. If I do that, what can I learn? Well, you can't learn what color the next ball will be because that's random. So no matter how many times I repeat this experiment of drawing, I'll never be able to predict the next color. But I can learn the probability. 
if I continually draw and replace, I can learn to any level of accuracy that the probability of getting a red ball is 40 percent and the probability of getting a blue ball is 60 percent. So I can't learn what's going to happen, but I can learn the probability of it happening. <clears throat> now here I've done an experiment like that, but it's a little different. Rather than drawing balls out of a jug, I've drawn returns on Apple's stock. A return is just a percentage change in the stock price. Day after day, from January 1st of 2016 to June 30th of 2018, and I've plotted them as a histogram. So if I had enough days, I couldn't learn what Apple's going to do tomorrow, but I could learn the probability of what it's going to do tomorrow, and it would look like this distribution. So in particular, I could get something that as an investor would be very important. What return could I expect if I purchased Apple stock? Well, if I had enough observations, it would be the mean of this distribution. The mean of this distribution would tell me what I could expect to earn if I purchased Apple stock. But it takes a lot of, of data. In order to estimate the, the mean of this accurately, I, I need between 50 and 75 years of data, which is a little difficult because Apple hasn't been around that long. So that's, um, that's what I could learn from this experiment of just drawing and recording. Now what is non-stationarity? Well, the problem is this works, this ability to learn the probabilities, if the probabilities themselves are not changing. So I have to be drawing from the same jug. As long as I'm drawing from this six blue balls and four red balls, I will eventually learn the probabilities with any precision I want. But nature may not be so nice. While my back is turned, she may change the, the jug. Whoops. After years of drawing out of the, the, the old jug, now nature has given me this one. And the probabilities are no longer 0.4 and 0.6. In fact, they're no longer just red and blue. This is what non-stationarity is. It's the fact that the world is changing in a way that we can't even learn the probabilities. And if that's happening, then we can't use this long, long data series for estimating something like the expected return on Apple stock because Apple stock may not be a common thing. It may be like these jugs. There's one apple, there's the other apple. And if I start mixing these things up, I could be mixing apples and oranges, so to speak. For instance, let's just stick with Apple for a second. This is Apple when I first purchased the, the stock in April of 1978. You may recognize these two, guys, uh, two Steves, Jobs and Wozniak. They have this new company, it's now public, called Apple. It had sales of $0.0078 billion. Most of all of it was in personal computers. Uh, there's the personal computer. And the company was run by these two young entrepreneurs. This is Apple in 2018. It's this giant corporation. The sales are $265 billion, which is up 33,600 times since 1978. 10% of the revenue comes from personal computers, and it's run by a large experienced management team, not two entrepreneurs. Does that jug sound like the same jug you had in 1978? So this is the problem. If, if I'm going to measure things more and more accurately by taking a bigger and bigger sample, I have to take a bigger and bigger sample of the same thing. But in the real worlds of investments, the thing may be changing. And that says take a smaller and smaller sample. But if I take a smaller and smaller sample, the data are so random and noisy, I can't conclude anything. So this is an unfortunate state of affairs, but it is indeed a, a state of affairs. So uh, the conclusion is that there's reason to believe the contents of the jug are, are changing, then extending the sample period mixes apples and oranges, will not produce a meaningful result, use shorter time periods. But I just said, to avoid the noise, we want to use longer time periods. And this is a problem. This is why today, in our panel, 
50 years after Fama first put forth the efficient market hypothesis, there's immense disagreement. Two of the panelists said, oh, the market's just super inefficient. One of them, namely me, disagreed. But we were having that disagreement 50 years after the theory was put forth. We're not having the same disagreement about the speed of light in the, in the, in the world of physics, for example. So <clears throat> there's one further problem. And, and this is a problem not only in understanding investing. I think this is a problem in, in, in all aspects of life. In statistics, it's called data mining. But it, the problem is that you only have one history to analyze, and that can lead you to, to very misleading conclusions. So I'd like to introduce you to a famous physicist who happened to live next door to my parents' best friends and I was lucky enough to know as a teenager. Uh, when you see pictures, how many of you know who Richard Feynman is? Oh, good, oh, good. Well, he was not only a, a wonderfully brilliant physicist, but he was also just a, a remarkably energetic and insightful person. Usually when you see him, you see a picture of him as an older man, like when he uh, served on the panel to uh, investigate the explosion of the Challenger. This is a, period, a picture of him when he was 24 years old and working at Los Alamos. That was his Los Alamos badge picture. He left graduate school to spend time on the, the Manhattan Project. Now, since we're on the subject of finance and physicists, I want to introduce you to one other person. This is Merton Miller. Merton Miller is one of the giants of finance, another Nobel Prize winner, who did work on investments. And when he won his Nobel Prize, he said the following. I still remember the teasing that we economists, Harry Markovich, William Sharp, and I had to put up with from the physicists and chemists in Stockholm when we conceded the basic unit of our research, the expected return, was not actually observable. I tried to tease back by reminding them of their neutrino, a particle with no mass whose presence was inferred only as a missing residual from the interaction of other particles. But then he said, but that was eight years ago. In the meantime, the neutrino has been detected. <laughs> the expected return still hasn't. Now, unfortunately, Mert has passed away. And he didn't get to live to see the day when the physicists now claim that 95% of the mass energy in the universe consists of something that they have no idea what it is. So we now believe that we're not so bad with expected returns. But to go back to data mining, let's look at a sample. Anyone know what this is, these numbers? I heard an answer. It, uh, she's right. It's, the it's, it's not pi, because pi is an infinite series. It is actually, to be precise, the first 1,000 digits in the expansion of pi. And <clears throat> Feynman used to love this. When he was in high school, he would memorize the first 762 digits, which he could reel off in less than a minute. And then he would get to a certain point, and he would say, 99999, and so on. What was he talking about? Well, you have to look carefully. Right there are, is the, the repetition of six nines. It occurs at the 762nd digit, which is now called the Feynman point of pi. And people look at that, and Feynman would say, well, isn't that amazing? What is the probability of getting six straight nines in the expansion of pi? For those of you who aren't math types, well, it's 1 in 10 times 1 in 10 six times, which is 1 in a million. So it's a 1 in a million shot, and it's occurring in the first 1,000 digits. I can tell you the chance of a one in a million shot occurring in the first thousand digits is less than one-tenth of a percent. So people, that is amazing. That is odd. What you really need to think, and, and this is relevant to so much investing, uh, mis misstatements, what it means for something to be odd or non-random. If you had not looked at this, if I had not highlighted this, and you had said, geez, I think there's going to be six nines in the first thousand digits of pi. If that was your project, prediction ex ante, 
That's pretty amazing. But if you look at the first thousand digits and you look for something weird and then you say that's weird, that may not be unexpected at all. For example, suppose it had been six threes. Would that be any different? Or six ones? Or what if there was one, two, three, four, five, six? Or what if there was ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four? All of those would be weird. And you start saying that once you look at it and find something that looks weird and then you say that's weird, that's almost certain to happen. For example, I have a friend, colleague, a little younger than me, born uh, in the September of 1953, and he looked at this and he said, that's weird. I said, are you talking about the Feynman point? He said, no, 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 I'm talking about this. 1953-09. That's when I was born. <laughs> I said, well, that may be weird to you, but it looked to me like six random digits. So the problem is, for any random sample, it will ex post, as Feynman says, look weird. If it doesn't look weird, that's weird. <laughs> In fact, and this is a Feynman trick too, there is a way to determine corruption in governmental reporting of statistics. And the, the way is, you get all the reported numbers, and then you look to see if they're really random. This is corrupt government officials who aren't good at statistics. And they will tend to not have enough weirdness to them, enough repetitions. And that's because the people forging the numbers don't, they think, I can't put in 99999, that'll look like I'm cheating. So they, they don't do it, and that in fact is a way to determine that they're cheating. So the reason for all of this is that weird things happen in the investment market, and then after the fact, someone says, that's weird, like it has some deep meaning. For example, here are a couple of, oh, I was going to tell you, I was going to finish with the nines, I forgot this. So, is it true that 99999 is somehow uniquely common in pi? And it, at first blush, it might look that way. The next time it occurs is a digit 193,034. And that's pretty close. That's not even a million yet. Now we got two of them. Boy, I'll bet those things are all over the place. Well, not so. The third one is at 590,331,982 digits. So, there is no pattern in the digits of pi that anyone has been able to discover. But here's an example. This is very recent. December of 2018 was one of the worst months for the S&P 500. Headline on the internet screams, Dow, S&P 500, post worst December since 1931, as NASDAQ has worst on record. And the article went on to describe what this might mean for investors and the risk and the future and so on and so forth. This is January 31st, uh, that should be 2019. We'll have to edit that, Sean. This is one month later. The best January in 30 years could mean good things for the stock market in 2019. I guess they forgot about December. In fact, it's kind of a, if you want to just pick out weird statistics, if you start on November 30th and you go through to the end of January, you end up almost exactly where you started. So all this meaning uh, is a lot like 99999. <clears throat> now, along this line, there are academic studies of anomalies. And this is something I, I spoke a little bit about at the panel today. Now all this stock price data is available electronically, and you have graduate students throughout the country spinning the, uh, the databases, looking even minute to minute to find patterns in stock prices. Those patterns are what are called anomalies. And it turns out that with all the PhD uh, uh, dissertations being written, that in the last five or six years, Researchers have found 452 anomalies. That is where it looks like this procedure could beat the market. Inefficiencies, as the speakers were talking about today. Well, 
three researchers, Hao, Zhu, and Zhang, took the time to try to replicate all 452. And 65% didn't get over the single first hurdle. That is, they were a lot like the nines. Looked like there was a lot there, even the second time, but they simply don't replicate. This is, again, a problem of data mining, finding something that is there in the one history, but is just a peculiarity of the sample. And it's very hard to, to, do, to sort that out. <clears throat> so with only one history, it's very hard to determine if you found a real anomaly or just an artifact of a particular sample, particularly if you're searching high and low for artifacts. If you want to do an experiment for yourself, go to the internet, download the next thousand digits of pi, and look for something odd. I'm sure you'll find it. <clears throat> well, whenever I, I talk about this, uh, about non-stationarity, about data mining and all, somebody always asks me about Warren Buffett. And I've been lucky enough to know Mr. Buffett. I've worked on a couple of litigation matters for him. And I refer to him as the great counterexample, because whenever I, I talk about the difficulty of finding true anomalies, someone says, what about Warren Buffett? Isn't he unique? And he might be. But you, you don't want to jump too quickly to that conclusion. Here's Mr. Buffett's actual performance since he founded Berkshire Hathaway in 1964. So here's Berkshire's performance and the S&P 500. And you can see that in the first three decades, Mr. Buffett just slaughtered the S&P 500. You know, the, the return differential was immense, unprecedented. But of course, you, you sort of knew that already because he wouldn't be worth $80 billion if it, hadn't, if it, if it wasn't unprecedented. But as time passes, it starts to erode. By the decade of the 95 to 2004, it's only 4% over the market. In 2005 to 2017, it's only 1.62. And in the last 10 years, Buffett has actually underperformed the S&P 500. So clearly, even though there may be an element of Mr. Buffett being unique, there is probably also an element of non-stationarity in data mining. Data mining meaning he became famous because he picked the right nines, and non-stationarity being it's a lot easier to find good investments when you're little and young than when you have a giant company and you're old, and that's non-stationarity. <clears throat> so where do we stand on testing the efficient market hypothesis 50 years later? Due to noise, non-stationarity, data mining, along with the inability to agree on an asset price, pricing model, there's still a huge debate on market efficiency. However, it's still worth drawing out some of its investment implications. So let me say what they are. First of all, is it possible to be stupid in an, in an efficient market? Now you have to think about this one for a minute, because if all securities are properly priced and give you the fair risk-adjusted return, you, you can't pick a good one. But if you can't pick a good one, you can't pick a bad one. Because if someone could pick a bad one, you could just track that person and do the opposite of what they did, and that would be good. So in the sense of buying the wrong company, you can't be stupid. But there are still ways to be stupid if you want. <laughs> and the first is by taking risks that you don't have to take risks. For example, if you had your retirement portfolio and you put the entire thing in Tesla, you would have a very risky portfolio. But you would, you, you, the market doesn't give you a premium for that. That failure to diversify properly is unnecessary risk, and it's not rewarded, and that's a way to be stupid. And the other way to be stupid is to trade a lot. In an efficient market, if you buy one stock, I mean sell one stock and buy another, you've kind of run in a circle like a hamster. Since both are fairly priced, you haven't gotten any better. <clears throat> but you've paid two commissions. So every time you run in a circle, you kind of just throw a little money away, and that would be stupid. So in an efficient market, the final advice is 
diversify widely, and minimize trading. And by the way, active finance managers hate this advice. So if you can't test it in practice, can you test the efficient market hypothesis in theory? And yes, you can. You can prove that it can't be right in theory. And these two guys, another Nobel Prize winner, Joe Stiglitz, along with Sandy Grossman, did that. It's a pretty simple argument. Stiglitz and Grossman said, look, remember all those competing investors trying to find misvalued stocks by hiring PhDs, using the latest software, having the fastest communications, et cetera? Remember them? Well, how do they earn a return on all that expense? By finding misvalued stocks. But wait a minute. If the market's efficient, there are no misvalued stocks. Uh, <clears throat> but that means that uh, the, the competing investors will start to give up and go away. But if they give up and go away, then the prices won't be efficient, because they're the ones who are making them efficient by doing all that research and hiring all those PhDs. So Grossman and Stiglitz conclude that the market must be sufficiently inefficient that the most sophisticated astute managers can beat the market. And by the way, active managers love this, because they all tell you that they're the ones who are going to beat the market, like Grossman and Stiglitz say. Now, final guy I want to introduce you to, Bill Sharp. And if you remember nothing else from this talk, remember this part. Bill is also a Nobel Prize winner, and like Professor Feynman, was one of the most just insightful guys. He would come up with ideas that seemed so obvious after the fact that you'd say to yourself, I knew that, except of course you didn't. He did, and then after the fact you realized what a sharp guy he was, no pun intended. Uh, and I want to tell you about Bill Sharp's arithmetic. <clears throat> so whenever you hear an economic theory, there's all these things, that assumptions usually. The information's freely available. Uh, the market's competitive. Uh, there are no transactions costs and so forth. And on and on, and people's eyes glaze over and they think this economic theory, how can I know it's right with all these assumptions? Well, the sharp arithmetic is great that way. What does it require? Well, it requires that the rules of arithmetic hold. The two and two is four. That is an assumption, not a very restrictive one. What else does it require? Nothing. <laughs> nothing. The economic theory that I'm about to tell you about requires nothing that, but arithmetic working. This is why Sharp is, is just so incredibly clever and insightful. Information can be spotty. Investors can be irrational and foolish, like some of the people were saying at the panel today. There can be rampant insider trading. I mean, this could be the, market, the, the stock market of Somalia, if Somalia has a stock market. And the Sharp arithmetic still works. So like I say, if I'm going to tell you about one thing, remember this one. So let me show you how it works. So in its simplest form, Sharp divides investors into two groups. Passive investors who don't try to beat the market. They just hold the market portfolio, widely diversified. And that's what passive is. And if you trade actively, you're obviously not passive. But you're also not passive if you hold like a lot of Tesla, uh, because you're not holding the market passively. So a passive investor, in Professor Sharp's sense, is someone who buys an index fund that just mirrors the market. And they don't try to beat it. They just hold it uh, throughout. And if everyone else is active. So you've now got the market divided into two parts, the passive investors and the active investors, OK? So what happens? Let's take a particular hypothetical year in which the overall market went up by 10%. And this number can be anything. I just picked 10% because it's easy to remember and work with. Well, if the overall market went up 
and the passive investors were just holding a market index passively, then they must, by definition, have gone up 10 percent, right? Seems to make sense. It only requires arithmetic. But if the overall market was up 10 percent and the passive part was up 10 percent, then by the laws of arithmetic, the active part as a group had to be up 10 percent. Because if the passive was up 10 percent and the active wasn't up 10 percent, the market couldn't have been up 10 percent. It's just the sum of the two. So now we know that in aggregate, both the passive investors and the active investors as a group earn 10 percent. But the active investors, they had all these costs. They had the PhDs, the, the uh, computers, the information networks, and so forth. So Sharp concludes, based only on arithmetic, that as a group, the passive investors will always outperform the active investors. And this doesn't require efficient markets or competition. This just requires arithmetic. And it's a pretty remarkable result. <clears throat> so when you see something like this, this is, these are all the mutual funds in the, in, the, in the country, and I've plotted how they've done year by year, how many outperformed the market. There's the 50 percent line. And you see this fact that the majority, and this, it's actually I just got the results for uh, 2018, it's the same. The majority almost invariably underperform the market. People say, well, oh, that's because it's hard to beat the market, and that's because uh, this was a good or bad year or something. That's all baloney. It's because of arithmetic. If you look at these as a group, they've got to underperform the market because of the costs. Now let me show you why this happens, and, and, and it carries with you a warning. So we're going to work through a little thought experiment here, as Professor uh, Einstein used to like to do. Gordon Gecko, who, uh, if you have to be older like me and seen the old movie Wall Street, gets a tip that Apple's going to buy Tesla for $500 a share. He starts buying up the stock, and the price starts to rise, naturally. Who sells? To ask yourself, if Gecko's buying, who sells? Well, it can't be the passive investors, because as the price of Apple rises, so does the amount they want to hold of, uh, in Apple. They always have the right amount of Apple, because as its price goes up, it becomes a bigger share of the market, and they hold a bigger share of the market. So the passives never sell. So the sellers must be other active investors who conclude that the rising price may be as evidence of overvaluation. So Gecko profits, but at the expense of other active investors. So remember I said that active investors as a group always lose to passive, but within the active investors, some may do better and some may do worse. But they can only do better at the expense of other active investors. So, the sharp arithmetic works. Now, <clears throat> what Bill says from this is know your counterparty. If you decide that you are not going to be passive, then you're going to be active and you're going to be in that pool. And uh, Bill's warning reminds me of an old gambling joke which is if you sit down to play cards and find yourself asking who's the sucker, get up. You're the sucker. And so Bill says, if you think you're beating the market, you're not beating the market. You're beating your counterparty who traded with you, uh, like the gecko example. So you have to ask, who, are you, who is your counterparty when you trade? Well, it might be Goldman Sachs. They trade a lot. Or Morgan Stanley or J.P. Morgan, or UBS, all these were pretty active traders. So these are the guys you're going to beat. And here's Lloyd Blankfein, and there he is. That's your counterparty. <laughs> you're selling. They're buying. I don't know who's doing better, but I'm a little nervous for you. <clears throat> and incidentally, the sharp arithmetic has had a big impact on the financial markets generally. 
and the movement toward passive investing. This is a three-year-old picture of the UBS trading floor. Uh, before Bill's work was as commonly known as it is. This is the current picture. The, these things are starting to have a, a real impact. <clears throat> oh, here are some other potential counterparties. Bill Simons is a famous billionaire and uh, founder of Renaissance Technologies. You may have read some of this guy, these guys' books, Ray Dalio. He gives you all this advice about investing, but he never says, hey, when you follow all this advice, I may be on the other side. And then, of course, there's always my favorite person, the great counterexample, who uh, <clears throat> talked up Apple a lot, and it turned out he was actually selling it uh, at the end of last quarter. So if you were buying Apple because you heard that Mr. Buffett owned a lot of it, he may have been selling it to you. So. <clears throat> I want to give you some challenges uh, to wrap up here, putting these concepts together. So following the implications of the sharp arithmetic, more and more naive investors are, are, are switching to passive. I think that makes a lot of sense. But that means, how can the sophisticated investors make superior returns? Because they're just trading with each other. The suckers are now all passive. So the only way to beat the market is to beat your counterparty, which is another sophisticated person. Without the naive investors, the liquidity could dry up because you don't want to trade with someone equally sophisticated. If liquidity dries up, how do you figure out what the price is? How does the market even work? How will the market become efficient? How will investment funds be wisely allocated? All this becomes a problem. Imagine the outright limit where everyone is passive. Well, then how does the price of one stock relative to another ever change? These are unanswered questions. But I want to end with some uh, practical investment implications from what I've said tonight. The first is, be very skeptical of strategies that have supposedly beaten the market. The observed outperformance could be, and I say probably stronger than that, is almost certainly due to some combination of data mining and non-stationarity. The sharp arithmetic is a much better reason for being passive than market efficiency. The market may be inefficient, but you have to ask yourself, who's going to beat it, me or my counterparty? And even if that's my point, even if there are market inefficiencies, are you the one who's going to exploit them? Finally, always be aware of the costs of excessive trading and inadequate diversification. So those are the three big principles I wanted to leave you with. The idea of market efficiency, the Grossman-Stiglitz critique, and most importantly, uh, the sharp arithmetic. So I think that's about uh, the end of what I have to say, and I'd be pleased to take any questions. Are you, uh, you're going to handle the questions? Hi, thank you for speaking. That was a really interesting talk. And I just. Is that on? Can, oh, can everyone, can everyone, okay, yeah, there you go. Um, my question is the, um, when you plot data and you're looking for, or the, the fact that you think everything is noise because it's not enough data, doesn't that only apply if all these data points are independent of each other? If they were not independent of each other, wouldn't it be possible that nine nines could indicate something going forward? Well, in fact, asset price changes are virtually independent of one another. Because if they weren't, you could predict the price change based on the correlation. And if you could predict the price change based on the correlation, the market price would change to take account of that prediction until there was no correlation. So when you look at actual asset prices, the market has undone that, and they're virtually independent. Not perfectly, but it's so close that for government purposes, there is no correlation. Hi. Thank you for your talk. So you mentioned how there's kind of going to be a balance between passive managers and active managers. Someone's got to set the prices. As we see more and more computational hedge funds coming up, we actually had a speaker come a little while ago 
who ran a fund of funds for algorithmic trading. He said that a few funds are going to sc scale extremely well. Do you see in the future much of the investing population being passive and saying only a few hedge funds saying the prices, or do you still see a certain number being necessary in the market? Well, I think that there's enough misinformation that there's always going to be a lot of active investors. For example, uh, you mentioned a fund of funds. That's a really expensive thing. That sounds to me like a bad idea of bad ideas. Uh, <laughs> because you've got to pay the fees of the underlying fund, then you've got to pay the fees of the fund of funds, and now you're an active investor who already has two strikes against you. Uh, so uh, that sounds like a bad idea, and I would highly recommend that you go passive rather than that. If you want to be an active investor, I mean, we at Cornell Capital think there are some thir certain things that look attractive, but they can't be obvious things, and you've got to try to exploit them cheaply. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to be worth it. Thanks for your, uh, your talk, Dr. Cornell. Uh, I'm just wondering what you think the role of uh, private market investments are for uh, your average investor. I know there's accredited investor uh, restrictions and all that, but maybe even REITs for people and all that. Um, are you, you know, a, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Hold the mic up a little bit just so I can hear a little better too. Of course. Uh, what do you think the role of a private market or alternative investments are for your average investor? Uh, presumably someone who's, you know, working in finance or technology and making a decent living. Well, that, you know, along the lines of what David Svensson has done at, at Yale, people end up looking at, you know, more exotic investments like buying private firms or buying commodities or, uh, you know, even buying rare, rare metals. I'm not very convinced that that's particularly useful, a pretty good idea. I still think the best thing to do is, and this is, I'm echoing Warren Buffett here, is to buy productive American businesses at fair prices. And doing something more than that is probably going to be a mistake. It, 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 it strikes me as a sales pitch. But I'll tell you this, if you do something dramatic, um, let's say I, I plunge into small pharmaceutical companies. I can be certain of doing very well or very poorly almost. If I do very poorly, I close up shop, start a new fund doing something different. If I do very well, I trumpet it to the world. And you get a real survivorship bias. In, in fact, I used to, to joke with some of my friends, if I was particularly cynical about this, I would start two funds. I would go really long Tesla in one and really short Tesla in the other. And one of them would do really well and one of them would do really poorly. I'd close the one that went poorly, tough luck, and then I'd trumpet myself as an investing genius. <laughs> so you, you have to be careful of that type. There's always going to be people who did really well doing something exotic, just like you're going to find nine nines, six nines in pi. But whether it has meaning or not is a totally different question. Thank you very much, Dr. Cornell. My question has to do with what, as a passive investor, it means to track the market with regard to international diversification specifically, because I noticed our frame of reference here was almost always the S&P 500, never the global stock market as a whole. And among passive investors, even the most outspoken advocates, there's no consensus as to what the ideal international diversification is, even though 45% of the market cap of the world is outside the U.S. You'd expect them to just agree on that, but they don't. Why do you think that is? Well, it's because you have a, you know, so many countries and so many markets that are underdeveloped. But in honor of John Bogle, who just passed away recently, Vanguard is doing a real good job of developing more internationally diversified funds. That's easy to do into Europe and Japan, and they're now Chinese ones too. So it's pretty easy to be a 90% diversif internationally diversified passive investor now. Thank you for your talk. Um, quick question, when you mentioned that, let's say a counterparty would be Renaissance Technologies, and they have consistently been beating the market rid with ridiculous returns for so many years, what exactly do they have that 
uh, an investor wouldn't have? Is it just better information or they're better at uncovering those anomalies in the market? Or y The answer is because they won't tell you, I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, and, and, it, and it could have a big portion like the great counter example of luck. But to the extent that they are doing that, they are doing that uh, at the expense of other active investors. One of my uh, colleagues, uh, Jason Sue, uh, is an active manager, and his active manager strategy is to find markets that are dominated by individual investors in other parts of the world. He says, for example, China's still really good that way, because there are lots of individual investors. So he, <laughs> he's on a search, not so much to find undervalued stocks, as to find uh, investors to whom he can sell mispriced or buy, buy from or sell mispriced securities. And maybe Simons is able to do that. That's the reason that you should be very careful, because Jim Simons and all his technology may be trading with you. We got one more question up here, I think. Hi, thanks again for your talk. Uh, I was just wondering to hear what you thought about the role of information asymmetry with regards to the efficient market hypothesis. Well, <clears throat> and, and this now I'm speaking to efficient markets and not uh, the sharp arithmetic. But yes, it, if, if there is asymmetric information, the market price can be wrong. I'll tell you a good example, Enron. When Enron was trading at 60 bucks a share, the investors in the marketplace didn't know that half of their assets were phony. So it was mispriced. Yes, that was serious asymmetric information. Hi, thank you so much for uh, coming today and speaking uh, with us about this topic. Um, so I'm wondering, with the trend of uh, more passive invest, people becoming more passive investors, uh, one of my concerns is when the market is being really volatile, that that could exacerbate the volatility and cause stock prices to go much lower, because if you're holding a passive investment and there's a lot more passive investors, that could happen. Um, and likewise with uh, the stock market going up, and so that may be uh, what's been happening in the past year. I'm wondering if you see any other um, problems with this trend of more people becoming passive investors. Well, it, it, passive investing per se shouldn't cause any added volatility. It would only be flows in and out of the market. If people pour into the market and then the passive funds, you know, into passive funds and the passive funds have to buy the securities, that could, you know, generate some momentum. But passive investing per se I don't think would have any impact on volatility. I mean, as it's increased, the market volatility, and it's gone way up in the last 10 years, the market volatility hasn't increased. Okay, well, I've enjoyed uh, spending the evening with you. Thank you very much. There's a wonderful book out there. Uh, <laughs>